mateys! Welcome back to another Cambridge Admissions video. Today, we're gonna do a Q&A. So, I had requested a few of you on my Instagram to DM me a few questions that you guys might want to ask about the Cambridge applications process, or UCAS in general, or my application. Today, I'll be trying to answer some of the most frequently asked questions and hope this is useful. So, without any further ado, let's get sailing! One is how did you choose what unis to apply to or what made you want to apply to certain universities? Since I had already made up my mind about which course I wanted to study, which was biological sciences, I primarily used the ranking tables to determine which universities I wanted to apply to because that was how I got an idea of which university was perhaps better for my course versus which wasn't so great for my course. For every college that I was interested in from the ranking by course, I conducted further research and explored other aspects of the course. For example, the content that's included, what's the exact name of the course, the qualification I would get after I completed the three to four years for the course. So I put all of this onto Google Sheets and then for every university, I color coded it with red, orange, yellow, and green um, in the order of reach, uh, match, and safety. Orange was kind of in the between of like reach and match. This kind of helped me get a better idea of how realistic I can be while doing my UCAS application. I wanted about one to two reaches, two to three matches, and about one to two safety schools in my final UCAS application. So slowly I tried and narrowed down my list to include this type of ratio for my final five schools. Now remember every student is different and you have the best idea of how you perform. So obviously while you decide which schools are your um, reaches, matches and safeties, do be realistic but also don't underestimate your own potential. After I sort of created this master list, the next part was narrowing down to just five unis, which can often seem like the hardest part. So now comes the time where you kind of decide which factors that you want to prioritize more. For instance, it may sound silly to a lot of you, but a factor that I quite prioritize is the weather. After I made my master list, all the unis from Scotland were just instantly out because I could not imagine dealing with that weather for three years. And the weather might be quite a valid concern for many others of you. Try and note down any other factors that you might want to consider that vary from the universities that you have on your list and try and make the list shorter and shorter till you come to about five to six unis. Question number two. What were the five universities that you applied to and did you get into all of them? The five universities that I applied to was King's College London, Imperial College London, University College London, University of Warwick and of course Cambridge University. And yes, I did get into all of them. In fact, University College London was the first offer that I received and I remember being so thrilled about just having a place to go to after high school. I'll write down the names of the exact courses and the course code um, for each of the universities that I applied to in the description box below. Question number three, what were your IB subjects? Okay, there were so many changes. In the beginning, I took biology, chemistry, and math, higher level, and English, Hindi B, and economics, standard level. At that point, in the initial first two weeks of IB, I was still kind of debating between economics and psychology, so I requested my counsellor and actually sat in both my psychology and economics IB classes for the first two weeks to get a feel of both the subjects. I actually ended up loving the two weeks of psychology classes and I just decided to go with my gut instinct. It was not as though I hated econs, it's just something told me to go for psych. So I ended up switching my third SL from econs to psychology. Then. Two months into the IB, I switched math and psychology. So math became standard level and psychology became higher level. In the end, I ended up doing biology, chemistry, psychology, higher level, and English lit lang, Hindi B, and math, standard level. I love my subject combination and if you have any questions related to my IB subjects or this specific combination, do feel free to DM me or comment down below. The funny yet nerve-wracking part about all of this is that I was actually asked about one of these subject changes I made in the IB during my Cambridge interview by my interviewer. So stay tuned for my interview video where I will share this with you all. Question number four. Any tips for standing out in your application and getting into your desired college? So the thing to be clear about is that UK's priority is definitely academics when it comes to applications. So of course, goes without saying that you should try your best to keep a consistent academic performance in terms of your test scores all the way from 9th grade to 12th grade because this is what they ask in your UCAS application. 
But apart from that, there are a few more factors that you can keep in mind that I feel would make you stand out in your application. Number one, recommendation letters. In the UCAS, there is an option for your counselor to send in recommendation letters from your academic teachers as well as a counselor recommendation. So first of all, to get a good recommendation letter, the number one thing you can do is to build and maintain a good relationship with your teachers, staff, and counselors. And this goes beyond academic performance. It could mean sometimes spending your free time to go have a chat with one of your academic teachers, to approach them for advice to do with anything from academic matters to personal matters, of course, depending on how close you are to your teacher. So before you worry about standing out in your university applications, Try and focus and make the effort to stand out from your peers in your class by going and making the extra effort to approach your teachers, ask them for advice, and be on good terms with them. And coming back to recommendation letters, before you submit the names of the teachers that you want to send in for the recommendation letter to your counselor, go and formally request or inform your chosen teacher that you will be using their recommendation letter for your uni application. This will hopefully make them more inclined towards writing you a better recommendation letter because they know that it's actually going to be used by you. And for recommendation letters, the general advice is to use those from teachers who taught you in the 11th and 12th grade academically or those who know you the best. So of course, a combination of both of these factors will hopefully make for the best recommendation for your application. Now here's a bit of story time about me and one recommendation letter that I really wanted. So the head of science at my school was also my IB higher level chemistry teacher. He was highly qualified and I loved his classes. So obviously I was thinking that I would love a recommendation letter written by him. I really wanted to go request him for a recommendation letter, but this teacher was like slightly intimidating to approach. In my school, all teachers need to write recommendations for all of their students. So I knew that he would write me one definitely, but I wanted it to be a unique, personalized recommendation letter. So I mustered up all my courage and stood by the door after one of our chemistry classes and stopped him to tell him that I was strongly considering using his recommendation letter for my university application. That's it. And the next day, I was waiting for my cab outside school to go back home and he was walking by. Seeing me, he approached me and he was just asking me a bit about what are my extracurricular interests and hobbies and what I like to do in my free time apart from academics. He said that he wanted a better idea for what he can write in my recommendation letter. After that conversation, I was so happy that I actually took the extra effort to approach him and tell him formally that I want to use his letter because otherwise he perhaps wouldn't have cared so much about writing a good one for me. In our school, there's also this policy that the students are not allowed to read the recommendation letters that the teachers write for us. And I couldn't really decide which teachers I wanted to use recommendation letters of for my application. So I went and gave my counselor four teacher names. And out of this, I asked him to pick the two best letters he thought would benefit my application the most. Later, I asked my counselor what he thought of my recommendation letters. And all he said to me was, oh, I definitely think they strengthen your application. So yeah, moral of this long rambling story, put yourself out there and go the extra mile in terms of building and maintaining a good relationships with your teachers, staff and counselors, because you never know where they might help you in ways you can't even imagine. Second, writing a good personal statement. Now this has two parts to it. One is the 80-20 ratio that I was told by someone. So your personal statement is 80% academic, but ensure that you do include 20% of your extracurricular interests and hobbies, but directly link these to your course of study. Otherwise, they are kind of redundant and don't really add any value to your personal statement since the UK is quite academically oriented in terms of applications. Also in your personal statement, Try and include excerpts or anecdotes from your work experience or internships or any sort of attachment that you perhaps had with any professional from your field of study. About 50% of my personal statement was taken from incidents that happened at my internship or the job shadowing that I attended. So I feel that they do make your personal statement stand out because it is very unique and personalized to what you experienced and shows what you have learned. Question number five. What was your predicted grade and final score? So as I mentioned in a previous video, I did the IB diploma program, which is scored out of a total of 45 points. My IB predicted grade was a 44 and I lost the one point in English. I was part of the batch that did not write her final exams due to COVID-19. Um, so my final grade was a 43, 
and I actually ended up losing my two points in math and Hindi B. And that's the rant I'm going to save for another day, but those were my scores. Question number six. Would you be able to share your ECAs and your academic achievements? So I'm guessing you're asking in the context of university applications. So I'll share what exactly I got to showcase in my UCAS application. So these were the subjects that I took in my IGCSEs. I got 11 A stars. This was my SAT score. I also did the subject SATs for biology and math level two. I thought doing math level two would be beneficial, especially since I dropped HL math. I just mentioned my IB scores. These basically comprised my academic achievements slash qualifications. Coming to extracurriculars, in my personal statement, I mentioned that I was an avid yoga practitioner. I mentioned that I attended MUNs and that I was the head girl of my school which is basically that I was involved in student government. There's also this mini section in the UCAS where you can state any sort of employment that you've um, experienced. So I actually had a small baking business when I was all the way back in eighth grade. And I remember asking my counselor if it's even worth uh, mentioning this in my UCAS since it was quite long ago. And he said that just mention anything that you can. You never know what they might value. So yes, I did put that uh, mini business up there and I also included my unpaid internship as part of my work experience because apparently that counts. Question number seven. Where did you do your internship? So I got to experience two places. In the first one, I got to attend an unpaid internship with my best friend at Singapore Polytechnic for one week. Her aunt was a researcher at that lab and that's how we got the opportunity. The lab was a molecular biology laboratory. So we did all sorts of things from growing bacteria, performing gram staining, running the PCR machine, performing bacterial DNA extraction, and observing cell culture. Almost none of this I knew before I actually went to the internship um, in terms of hands-on experience. And it really was a whole new world. But my friend's aunt was the best supervisor we could have asked for. And she really ensured we understood every single thing that we were doing. And she taught us so many new things. It was genuinely one of the most exhausting yet rewarding experiences of my life. After this internship, I also got the opportunity to job shadow at Singapore General Hospital, which is one of the large public hospitals in Singapore. This um, attachment was for about five to six days, and I basically got to observe one lab every day for each of these six days. The labs that I got to observe were pathology, virology, clinical biochemistry, his pathology and cytogenetics. This was quite a different experience from the internship that I had previously done because I wasn't really allowed to do much of hands-on things since it obviously had implications on like patients, samples and all of those um, legal things, I guess. Of course, a hospital is also a much busier place than a laboratory. So many of the times, most of the professionals didn't really have time to explain to me the nitty gritties of what they were doing and the concepts behind it. But I did get to meet quite a few interesting people who were genuinely passionate about their work, who carved out time from their busy schedules to actually explain to me the concepts behind what they were doing. And I was super grateful for that because otherwise it was just a lot of research and making my own notes. Question number eight. How are you paying for your studies since it is quite cost intensive? I am very privileged that my parents are able to sponsor my tuition fee 100%. I do understand that's not the case for a lot of people out there. But many unis and colleges in the UK do provide a multitude of scholarship options, both financial and merit scholarships. So it's a great idea to research and check out online which of these scholarships might apply to you and what you can do to get them. Question number nine. What were your IB conditions for Cambridge? So for those of you who don't know, in the UK, you are offered a place at a college with a condition that you have to meet in your final exams. So for me at Cambridge, that condition was a 41 overall with a 776 in my higher level subjects and 6 in my SL English. And the last question, question number 10. How did you end up choosing Churchill College? In my previous video, I showed a screenshot of the sort of table I made to shortlist the colleges in Cambridge that I was interested in applying to. I had a few factors that were a must that I basically researched for in all the years. So a few of these factors are, I needed a vegetarian and vegan option at preferably every meal at college because these are my dietary preferences and I would rather go to a college that suited me in that term. I also wanted the college atmosphere to be friendly, helpful and nurturing. 
if you actually conduct research about the Cambridge colleges, you would see that each college has its own mood or vibe. And this ranges from super academically oriented to very relaxed and extracurricular oriented. So I was more in this part of the spectrum. And I also wanted my colleges to have lots of extracurricular options. I did not want a super pressurizing, academically oriented college. I decided that I would rather have a college that was more into extracurriculars. Of course, you are still under the academic pressure of being at Cambridge, but I did not want this to be intensified by the college that I was in. So after considering these factors, I shortlisted to about five to six colleges. And then I shortlisted it to three colleges. And out of these three, I just randomly picked Churchill. I don't really remember why. Of course, the factors vary from individual to individual. I met this girl recently, virtually, who ended up picking Emmanuel College because they offered a free laundry service. And one of my friends picked Christ College because it's close to the Nando's and the movie theater. So there's really no compulsion for which factors you want to consider. It's all up to you. All in all, just remember that no matter which college you pick, you're still going to be under the umbrella of the University of Cambridge. So eventually, it won't matter too much, I guess. But it does matter a bit. So check out, check out this video where I explain why it matters. So that was the end of the Q&A. If you have any further questions, leave it down in the comments below or DM me on my Instagram. And I will continue with the Cambridge interview series soon. So stay tuned for that. If you're enjoying these videos, please don't forget to leave a like below and subscribe. <laughs> I'll see you in my next video. Till then, take care and good luck. Bye!